Hello, and welcome to CIA Files, True Stories of U.S. Intelligence. I'm your host, Topher M. Ford, and with me, as always, is uh, Mr. Brandon Givens. Uh, how are you doing, Brandon? Oh, pretty well, pretty well. Um, I celebrated my anniversary this weekend. That was, that was a lot of fun. Went to some nice That's restaurants. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. And so it snowed on Wednesday here. Which you oh, know, wow. it's still in you know, still in October, so it was kind of uh, interesting there. Like, oh well, you know, in this climate, but now it's warm again or warmish. But yeah, doing pretty well overall. Right on, that's awesome. I'm also uh, doing well, I guess. <laughs> 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 Had to take a moment to uh, inventory, but yeah, things are good, and. I'm happy that we are getting back on track. We've had some uh, road bumps. Well, this is a good one to get back to. This is a really amazing story. <laughs> I had a lot of fun researching this and um, finding out more things. I mean, especially when it comes to dad. <laughs> you know, you have this like really interesting character and then you find oh, out yeah. more about his dad. You're like, whoa, yeah. this is insane. <laughs> I know. Uh, if you don't know, this episode is on Kim Philby, um, British spy master uh, who was part of MI6, but who was also uh, a spy for the Soviets and probably the most successful double agent in history. You know, I don't know that <laughs> there may have been others. Um, you know, I don't know all of the different double agents throughout history, but holy crap. He, no, he, cli he climbed that he ladder of success <laughs> in many, many, many different ways. He is an inspirational story to um, alcoholics everywhere. I mean, <laughs> I mean just oh what gosh. that man pulled uh, off. Oh, my gosh. Are you and he probably doesn't remember me? half of it. It was like, I went on this bender oh. and I woke up in <laughs> Moscow. I think I may have committed high treason. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, he's and his story as we get through, you know, toward the end of it, we'll learn is another tale on how British British people are, or at least, you know, the British people who were at the top levels of MI6. And we're going to do things a little different this time. Uh, instead of sticking with Kim Philby, after this, we're going to stick to the same time period and discuss someone else. And we're going to go through a few people like this, and then we're going to progress with all of the different people in step. Because I really wanted to show the connection between all of these people and how... It is a pretty small club it is. at the end of the day. And that was another thing. It's just like how clear it becomes, how small this club of people is <laughs> that was like pulling these strings and backstabbing each other. And it's kind of like a high and school. It, you all, yeah. <laughs> it's early intelligence community. It's and just, I think that we will, this is what I've picked up on is that in these formative years, Right after World War II, you know, everything was different around the world in some very dramatic ways. And a lot of those changes were instigated by the people that we're discussing. And the more you look at their story, the more you think that they maybe didn't really understand what they were doing. Sometimes they knew that they didn't know. And sometimes they thought that they knew but in the long term, did not get the results that uh, maybe they were hoping for. Well, yeah, I mean, um, many of our puppet governments and, you know, like things that have been established were put in place by the most um, intelligent and successful of the functional alcoholics. Right. But alcoholics, they definitely were. <laughs> uh, we've said it before, but I just, you know the role that alcohol played in the formation of the CIA and what becomes 
our current glo- global political situation was all kicked off in this I, time period. I, I was um, playing a little thought exercise in my mind. Like, I know that cannabis smoking, and it goes back forever, but like truly potent cannabis is moderately recent to my understanding. You know, like how they can get the THC level so high. And, right, I, I think that's true, yeah. And um, I'm just curious what would have happened if like a time traveler went back and, you know, had people instead of, you know, growing sugar for rum or, or tobacco, just, just taught those people how to grow really, really good weed. And <laughs> would we have not had the wars or gone back to, you know, Genghis Khan and the Mongolians then and been like, hey, guys, you know, why don't you just smoke Here, this? Puff and, on this for a second. And like, yeah. Oh, so, why yeah. am we killing all these people? <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> we should invite them over for dinner. <laughs> yeah, I'm really thirsty. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, this is part one of uh, Kim Philby. We are not professing to tell you the complete story of these activities. We are professing to tell you the complete story that we know. These records that we've uncovered don't tell the story. This is CIA files. They tell pieces of it. True stories of U.S. intelligence. Something I owe to the soil that grew, more to the life that fed but most to Allah who gave me two separate sides to my head. I would go without shirts or shoes, friends, tobacco or bread, sooner than for an instant lose either side of my head. Kim by Rudyard Kipling The English love their secrets, the knowledge that they know a little more than the man standing next to them. When that man is also a secret keeper, it redoubles what Trevor Roper called the exquisite relish of ruthless, treacherous, private power. A Spy Among Friends, Ben McIntyre. We understand so little about the concept of personal identity. It is one of the most important drivers behind a person's behavior and choices and actions. Personal identity might be the only motivating factor. If this is true, then how do we come to understand our own personal identities? If our sense of personal identity determines how we think and act, then what exactly determines the makeup of that personal identity? What factors make each of us how we are today? And how much influence do we have over our own personal identity? Kim Philby was born into peculiar circumstances and he played a major role in the struggle between ideologies that shaped our modern world. But to ask who he was is perhaps too big a question to ever fully understand. It was said of Philby that he was a genial man, pleasant and inquisitive. People tended to trust him instinctively, and he was always a willing confidant to anyone with something to get off their chest. He suffered from a slight stutter early in life, which some have speculated he used to his advantage later whenever he needed an extra moment to think of a lie on the spot. Philby inspired loyalty, trust, and a sense of security in those who moved within his sphere of influence. It was this ability that allowed Philby to work for Moscow in secret for so many years without drawing suspicion. Harold Adrian Russell Philby was born in 1911 in Ambala, Indian, while his parents were traveling across the country. In classic British fashion, young Kim was mostly raised by his nanny, an Indian, and his first language was Punjabi. India has uh, lots of climate regions and cultures, so life differed by region. Um, British India, or the Raj, included more countries than what we call India today. Just like today, that region had a very high population. Um, The density varied depending on where you lived. 
The Raj was divided into presidencies, kind of like provinces. About 40% of the country was princely states. That meant they were internally independent, but England controlled their foreign affairs. There were huge swaths of the country where the British had no direct control and traditional systems of government and ownership remained in place. With that said, malnourishment and hunger were a problem throughout the subcontinent. There was a gigantic difference in the wealth of the elite and the poorest in society. Most British colonials lived better than most Indians, but that doesn't mean that no Indians lived better than the British colonials. There was definitely an Indian elite and merchant class who would have lived better than low-level British bureaucrats. The lifestyles of the British and Indians of similar economic class differed, largely due to culture and segregation. The British didn't come in and displace and replace the population in the way they did in the American colonies and Australia. They didn't make like a large effort to bring women into the colony. I mean, there were merchants and planters who set up shop permanently, but for the most part, the colonists were colonial officials and soldiers. They were disproportionately single men, and when married, the wives often stayed back in the home country, or if they were wealthy or lucky enough, split time between them. Children born in the colonies were very often educated in the British Isles. Kim's father, Harold St. John Bridger Philby, was simultaneously a cartoonishly upper-class Englishman, and an eccentric, arguably treasonous, Arab sympathizer. St. John Philby worked as a spy for MI6, using his experience and connections in the Middle East to facilitate communication with Arab leaders. He would later be fired after sharing sensitive British intelligence with Ibn Saud, the founder and first king of Saudi Arabia. After that, St. John went on an expedition on Camelback, mapping the Saudi-Yemeni border. Kim Philby's father, St. John, or St. John, was a colonial official in British India. St. John really deserves his own episode, and I expect we'll make one, so I'll just hit the major points as they relate to Kim and kind of setting up his life. Sinjin was born in modern-day Sri Lanka to an English tea planter who was known to be adventurous. He, he, he liked to, have, um, to entertain himself. Sinjin's mother, from a respectable family of priests and military officers, grew tired of her husband's adventures, and she took the kids and she returned to England. Sinjin's dad did not provide regular support, um, so it appears as if relatives chipped in to help pay for his you know, housing and education with his mother. And so he wasn't exactly spoiled, but he wasn't exactly deprived. He goes to a very well-established private school, and he attends Trinity College, Cambridge. He was known to be quite conservative and Christian up until his last year at university. He studied modern and oriental languages and was familiar with Urdu and Farsi. He did well enough on his civil service exam to be able to join the ICS, the Indian Civil Service. Once in India, he dives into the local culture. He scandalizes his colleagues by not only surrounding himself with local culture to practice the language, but actually inviting Indians into his home. He openly advocated that Indians be hired by the ICS, which they were. He, he joked that he was the only socialist in the ICS. Now, the British colonials, they, they like to form clubs, sort of like whiskey clubs or maybe a country club. Um, they mingle, make connections. Well, St. John threatened to resign from the club in Ambala if the Indian person he recommended wasn't admitted. So, he was admitted. 
He meets and marries a woman with ties to colonial administration, much like his mother. By the time of the birth of his son, Kim, he had a pretty big reputation for anti-racist sentiment. Ethnic and national identities are complicated, and being raised third culture can create some identity issues. But at least in Sinjin's case, he probably didn't identify as Indian. For one, he was born in Sri Lanka, which isn't India, which, it, you know, which India itself is full of diverse ethnic identities. And what we call what was British India is was, was a number of countries today. And two, his formative years were in England. Um, I mean, he was probably Indian sympathetic because of his socialist convictions. I mean, he, he goes on to become a pan-Arabist. In any event, Sinjin ends up replacing the famous um, Brit Lawrence of Arabia. And yeah, he converts to Islam and ends up working for the Saudis. Uh, he had no real cultural connection or history there, but once there, oh, he went native. Now, here's a little psychological insight. Sinjin named his son Kim after the character Kim in a Rutger Kipling novel. He was the guy that wrote White Man's Burden. He believed, you know, like, okay, white people had this moral duty to colonize lesser civilized places to help them advance. And, you know, the Europeans, they, they suffered as a result because they were separated from their families for years, sometimes life. They had to live without luxuries they were used to, and they often died of tropical fevers and diseases. Anyway, Kim is about a British boy in India, the son of a low-level British official. Um, both of his parents die, leaving him on the streets. He's but he's completely assimilated into the culture as a street urchin. People don't believe he's British. The locals don't exactly accept him, but eventually a colonial official recognizes he's not only British, but capable of blending in perfectly. He then gets sent off to be trained as a spy for the crown. Without knowing anything about Sinjin, you'd, you'd think he was an imperialist, and he named his son Kim because he likes Kipling. And the idea of his son being a spy for the crown really thrilled him. But with what we know about Sinjin, it seems more likely that he admired the character for his ability to assimilate and, well, go native. In naming his son Kim, perhaps his father set into action the course of events that made Kim Philby a spy. A friend once told me, as you name the ship, so it sails. Perhaps it was a little accidental chaos magic. Or perhaps the apple just doesn't fall far from the tree. Kim's mother, Dora Johnston, was born in Lahore, India in 1888. Her British father worked as a civil engineer for the Public Works Department in Rawalpindi, and their family enjoyed wealth and privilege. In 1910, she married St. John Philby and began traveling through the Middle East with him. She and St. John Philby would eventually separate, after which she moved to London. Once old enough, young Philby was sent to Westminster Public School in London, where he proved to be an adept student. One of his teachers later remarked, The regime of Westminster School was liberal, and I believe young Philby benefited from that. He probably suffered by missing the guidance of a father whom in some ways he resembled. The boy had no problems of adjustment. I found him intelligent, amusing, charming. He was a rebel at heart, I knew, but he had little of his father's eccentricity. Philby then attended Trinity College at Cambridge, where he befriended several liberal-minded fellow students who would go on to play pivotal roles in his life as well as world history. These friends included Guy Burgess and Don McLean, and all three would later become part of perhaps the most successful spy ring in history, the Cambridge Five, passing along British intelligence to Moscow for decades. 
Philby entered college disillusioned with British aristocracy and colonialism. He felt the Labour Party, the liberal wing of British politics, had failed, and so he turned to socialism. He joined the Cambridge University Socialist Society, where he discussed leftist ideology with his new friends. He later described how his ideology developed thanks to his experience at Cambridge. This brought me into contact with streams of left-wing opinion critical of the Labour Party, notably with the Communists. Extensive reading and growing appreciation of the classics of European socialism alternated with vigorous and sometimes heated discussions within the society. It was a slow and brain-racking process. While there, he also met Maurice Dobb. Dobb was a professor of economics and one of the first openly communist members of the British upper class. Dobb introduced the young idealists to communism and spoke at length about Karl Marx. According to biographer Ben McIntyre, Philby's indoctrination wasn't a sudden impulsive decision by a brash youth, but rather a drawn-out process. He canvassed on behalf of the Labour Party, but there was no sudden conversion, no revolutionary epiphany when the religion of communism seized his soul. Instead, the student moved slowly leftwards. Unlike many of his friends, Philby never joined the Communist Party. His beliefs were radical, but simple. The rich had exploited the poor for too long. Remember, the Communist Manifesto is not exactly light reading. In some social classes and areas, um, socialism and communism had an intellectual following. Maybe you remember from high school literature, the Victorian era, uh, where you had these romantic writers, you know, they, they were basically rich kids that wrote poetry uh, about not needing God, and you know, they just aggravated the establishment. Um, in the middle and upper class, the communists were probably about the same crew, just was later. Um, communists were also seen as a collection of societal rejects. Um, but, you know, again, going back to the whole middle and upper class, they could be, were often seen as just wealthy idealists who would probably grow out of it. This really isn't that much different to how kind of left-leaning people can be seen today. Oh, those rich limousine liberals. Then they called them parlor room socialists. And drug-taking hippies who just want to end marriage and, and all the old systems that make society work. The big difference, though, is communist and anarchist had been linked to a number of assassination attempts, bombings, and political violence. Anarchist or communist assassinated Tsar Alexander II, Umberto I, Archduke Ferdinand of Austria, which that helped start World War I, and U.S. President William McKinley. Uh, there were also issues like the Civil War that happened in Bavaria and political violence in Berlin right after World War I. Wherever communists went, violence seemed to follow. Views on democratic socialism or progressive politics ranged by region. But I'd lean towards saying they were mostly considered acceptable by the population in general. And when banned, were banned because an authoritarian regime was banning all competing ideas. But communism and anarchism definitely got people a bit more nervous, which becomes a big tool to discredit democratic socialism. Upon graduating, Philby told Professor Dobb that he was ready to dedicate his life to communism and asked how he might best serve the cause. Dobb led him to Louis Gibarty, who worked for Comintern, a group dedicated to spreading communism across Europe. Ben McIntyre described Philby's mindset at this time. The only bulwark against fascism was Soviet communism, the inner fortress of the world movement. Capitalism was doomed and crumbling. The British establishment was poisoned by Nazi leanings. Communist writers long said that capitalist elites would make common cause with fascism rather than lose control of the system. Social Democrats uh, resisted this belief, or at least decided it, it wasn't a reason to 
destroy the democratic system. Communists saw that after World War I, colonialism remained strong. What we call capitalism was and really is like a form of mercantilism with various degrees of protection and subsidy. A communist would say, oh, laissez-faire capitalism sounds good on paper, but it doesn't actually work out in real life. I mean, it either gets taken over by interest that make it not laissez-faire, or which then it kind of becomes freedom to fail and starve for the working class and subsidies and protectionist laws for those with power and connections. Well, fascism formalized this whole subsidy and protection part. While espousing free markets, it basically said the state should be a series of organized corporations. I mean, not just business corporations, but corporations of interest as well, like official labor unions and social organizations. The nature or way of organizing would depend on which fascist theorist is writing and coming up with these ideas. United States Vice President Henry Wallace summed up the method. They, the fascist, demand free enterprise. But are the spokesmen for monopoly and vested interest? Their goal is to capture power so that using the power of the state and the power of the market simultaneously, they may keep the common man in eternal subjugation. Most importantly, fascism ensured that the people who held the power didn't change, nor did the structure of society. In 1933, Gabarti directed Philby to another group in Vienna. He moved to Vienna under the premise that he was there to learn German. There he stayed with a married couple, and he quickly befriended their daughter, Litzy Friedman, who also lived there. She was slightly older than the new college graduate, already married and divorced, and an active member of the local communist organization in Vienna. Friedman and Philby soon became romantically involved, and she brought him into the activist fold, where he assisted with tasks like helping persecuted communists escape the country, delivering messages between members, begging for money, and anything else they could do to fight the rising tide of fascism that was moving through Europe. During this period, Philby's intellectual notions became direct action, solidifying his radicalization. In 1934, Austrian Chancellor turned dictator Engelbert Dollfuss began a suppression of leftist politics. He outlawed unions and began arresting and executing socialists and communists. In order to protect Litzy from the same fate, the two married and, using Philby's passport, moved to England. Right-leaning and fascist politicians liked to lump democratic socialists in with the communists. It's a strategy. Make your various enemies appear as one. They seem to be a greater threat than they really are, and that fear motivates the support base. This is also a time period in which you're seeing a lot of ec economic turmoil, like the Great Depression. And the Soviets during the Great Depression fared pretty well. So part of the, the fear of communist and communism was related to the fear that they might be successful. This manifested in different ways. Even the Catholic Church came out in favor of corporatism as a way of reining in the abuses of laissez-faire capitalism. To stop the national socialist and communist or have stability, many states became authoritarian, arguably fascist. Portugal, Italy, Austria, and Poland all had these sort of strongman governments. That also, too, plays into how people became motivated to join the Communist Party. They see just how quickly democratic nations turn to authoritarianism in order to keep the economic system and social hierarchy in place. Soon after arriving in London, Litzy introduced Kim to an NKVD agent named Arnold Deutsch, after a secret background check, Deutsch met with Philby and asked him to spy for the Soviet Union. Philby agreed and began the path that would turn him into either the greatest traitor in history 
or the greatest hero for humanity, depending on who's telling the story. Deutsch told Philby that he would have to publicly suppress his communist beliefs. Philby was to return to London and adopt the facade of the classically conservative British bourgeoisie. Deutsch described it by saying, He must become, to all outward appearances, a conventional member of the very class he was committed to opposing, Deutsch told him. The anti-fascist movement needs people who can enter into the bourgeoisie. Deutsch also trained Philby in the art of spycraft, how to leave secret messages, how to know if he's being followed, and how to lose them if he is, how to arrange discreet meetings, and how to photograph documents with the tiny spy camera Deutsch gave him. Philby returned to London with a new image and a new skill set. Like many spies, his entry into espionage started with journalism. Philby worked briefly for a literary periodical before taking a position with a Nazi-funded magazine called the Anglo-German Trade Gazette, which sought to strengthen ties between England and Nazi Germany. Philby also joined a pro-fascist organization called the Anglo-German Fellowship. To many of his friends and colleagues, Philby appeared to have become a pro-Nazi conservative, an image Philby found repulsive. Deutsch also asked Philby for other potential recruits. Philby directed Deutsch to one of his socialist friends from Cambridge, Donald McLean. He also recommended the outlandish, often abrasive Guy Burgess as well. Deutsch found McLean suitable, but thought Burgess too ostentatious for espionage. But Burgess would not be deterred, suspecting that his Cambridge colleagues were up to something. He was eventually accepted in what would come to be known as the Cambridge Five. Deutsch also noted that Philby and Litzy's marriage would stretch the credulity of Philby's cover, so the two separated, sacrificing their marriage to the cause of communism. When the Spanish Civil War broke out, Philby went there as a journalist and soon worked his way into the inner circle of Spanish General Francisco Franco, while cementing his image as a hardline conservative by writing positively about Franco. Philby was also gathering information on Spain's military, with special attention paid to the support they received from Germany and Italy, which he then fed back to Moscow. In 1937, Soviet leader Joseph Stalin began worrying about disloyal operators within the NKVD. He began recalling Soviet intelligence officers to Moscow, where they were interrogated and summarily executed. Deutsch was among those recalled despite his unwavering loyalty. Over the next decade or so, Philby would see numerous other Soviet handlers work with him only to be recalled to Moscow for execution or imprisonment. Brandon explains why this era of extreme paranoia came to be known as Stalin's Great Terror. Stalin might not have been the paranoid one, but rather the one creating paranoia on purpose. Paranoia creates niches. When people are afraid they might get purged, they start telling on other people to not be suspected. Paranoia also works as a sort of Stockholm Syndrome. It's like, oh, the, this person has so much power over me, but, but they, they haven't killed me. Uh, they, they're, they're so great. Also, if you're ratting out your coworkers, you're probably going to have to justify it to yourself. You know, like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm doing all this because, um, you know, Stalin's such a great guy. And as we act, so we believe ourselves to be. Uh, to be a dictator, it helps to be the smartest guy in the room. You might have to shoot everyone else in it, but make sure you're the smartest guy there. Maybe you've heard of tall poppy syndrome. Tall poppies get cut, so you know, try not to stand out. Look, anyone with talent was a potential threat to Stalin. A couple of false charges and an execution, and Stalin no longer has a threat. Not that Stalin would, but he could justify killing people who were loyal to him. Um, you know, if that happened by accident. If the people were really loyal to Stalin, then, then they want Stalin to succeed and bring about the perfect communist state. Paranoia within the population will help Stalin stay in power. 
By being killed, the person helps build that paranoia. So the person killed died for what they believed in, helping build the perfect communist state. Not all true believers in soldiers die on the battlefield. Now, many of the murders were for realistic, strategic reasons. Uh, many of the targets were Trotskyists. Trotsky was probably Stalin's greatest competitor for power, and also they had a serious dispute on the future of international communism and how to accomplish it. By killing those who worked with Trotsky, he was eliminating not only the possibility of a return of Trotsky, but Trotskyism itself, which outlived the life of Trotsky. Additionally, the purges were a method of hiding his own crimes. He killed people he had worked with in the past. He killed the, the people who knew where the bodies were buried. Basically, he killed his accomplices. Machiavelli would be proud. On the 3rd of September of 1939, two events would transpire that would greatly affect Philby's life. The first was that British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain declared war on Germany. The second was that Philby was introduced to his future second wife, Eileen Furse. Furse was perhaps the ideal wife for Philby, not because of their romantic compatibility, but because she was smart, attractive, and most of all, not interested in politics. Philby, however, would prove to be the worst husband she could have found, as his deceit and his apathy toward her would grow to massive proportions over the course of their marriage. Soon after the Second World War started, Philby began dropping hints that he was interested in joining MI6, the British Foreign Intelligence Service. Depending on the source, he was assisted in securing the job with the word from either his father, St. John Philby, or his fellow Russian spy, Guy Burgess, who'd already gained a job there. One or both of them dropped Philby's names to Marjorie Maxey, who served as chief of staff for the MI6 training program for propaganda. After a few meetings, Philby was invited to join the circus, as it was often called, and began his long career of undermining Western efforts to crush communism. Well, welcome back. I hope you guys and everybody enjoyed that. Uh, I found it extremely fascinating to research. Well, what do you? What would you? What did you find the most interesting thing, Chris? Oh, uh, you know the thing that I was really uh, fascinated by that I uh, picked up on that I haven't really heard mentioned a lot before, um, and it could be just because I'm not a history expert. But, you know, we mentioned in the intro, uh, Kim Philby's dad, St. John Philby and his mother, and they both, both of his parents were born in colonial, uh, India. And there seemed to be this thing, you know, in the time go going up, uh, you know, between the first and second world war, where maybe these these second and third generation um, British citizens who were born in, uh, you know, the colonial Orient, who were still very British, you know, but were also not that sympathetic to the crown and that they were, you know, they felt more connection to India and the people there. And there seemed to be a th you know, like a thing that started to build up in that time. And it made me really curious. I want to learn more about that. Um, yeah, it, it's worth delving into, but I would be careful because you'll you'll see the hits and forget the misses. Like <laughs> we're going to hear about the person that was like, ah, oh, screw the crown, the George Orwells. But we're, pro we're not going to hear about the 10 other colonials who were like, oh, man, this life is pretty sweet, being at the top of the chain and bossing oh, yeah, everyone around. Oh, for sure. And so, you know, that's that's one of the big challenges of, of history. I mean, well, any, any research is, you know, sometimes if you go looking for something, you'll find what you're looking for, but that doesn't make it true. 
You know, right. if you want to believe that there were a group of um, English colonials who were more sympathetic to India than they were to the British crown, you, you'll you find whatever evidence you want of that. But you really have to consider what about the people that, you know, don't fit that mold? How many really were there? It could just be, yeah, like a confirmation bias thing. But it seemed like I was seeing signs of, uh, you know, people popping up here and there. Well, yeah, the tall poppies, those are the ones you see. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, what was it? Um, the, uh, their salary, I was looking this up, like typical salaries and the, well, it was really more um, the 1800s, but it was like 300 pounds a year for someone working for the Indian civil service, which was a lot of money. It would be something like Two hundred thousand dollars a year today. I mean, it's that's really, really like so hard to compare money because you could see. Well, this is how much gold it is today. Um, you know, this is how it was linked to gold, and this is how much money you could get from that. But it, there's always many, many more hours worked. If you then compare, like, oh, this was the typical wage that somebody got, or how many hours of work this usually represented. Um, it was a sweet gig. Yeah. So. And was that how much like the British people would be making or that's, that's how much, that's not no. how much the average Indian yeah, no, would be no. making. I if imagine they it's in um, like a very similar system that um, we see in a lot of international companies is the, um, the foreigners, you know, like myself will make a salary um, greater than or equal to whatever we would get in our home country, but the local hires will get a local salary. Maybe maybe it'll be kind of good for the local economy, but you know, not they won't get the same salary. And um, you know, that's there's you know, there's kind of a yeah unpleasantness about that. But yeah, you know, they're like, oh well, we don't want to mess up the labor market, and also it's an affordability thing. Yeah. So. Our next episode, we're coming back with an actual CIA officer, uh, Frank Wisner. And I've been excited to get into his story, too. And Frank Wisner and Kim Philby don't really become connected until after the war. But they are connected in a very big way. And yeah, that's what that's my hope, is to tell this story about the people who, behind the scenes who... Uh, built their networks during the war and then used them after the war to establish what is today like our global capitalist market. <laughs> which is not which is not any form of uh, mercantilism. No, 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 no. It's free trade. It's, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what's happening. As in you're free to trade with us or <laughs> you're free to get overthrown. It's, it's completely laissez-faire, free market. I know I went to the Mises Institute, so I know that's what's happening. <laughs> Actually, I think that, to be fair to them, they do say that what's happening now really isn't laissez-faire capitalism. Oh, I do have um, a little story. You might want to kind of edit it into something earlier. It might be more fitting. But when I was in, I was a student in Japan for a year, and I went to this Irish pub, and there was a guy there. Um, this was like in 2000, and he, I think he was in his 80s or older, I mean, but he was pickled, and he did the whole thing, you know, I'll buy you a drink, you buy, you know, he just kept wanting to buy me drinks, and then the the um, uh, bartender was like, oh man, he, he's, the man is, is absolutely pickled, you're not, you know, you're going to have to just say no, otherwise you're going to be on the floor or something, but he was um, raised in Jamaica, and he was, you know, like a Anglo- British fellow, but he had spent, he had been in Japan since he was like 30 or 40 or something. And so most of his life had been in Japan. His formative years were in Jamaica. And yeah, I found that interesting. And so like when he was a kid, it was a part, um, directly part of the, the British empire. And I was like, well, where do you consider yourself from? And he was like, well, I'm Jamaican. Um, but you know, like that Jamaica just doesn't exist you right know? it's you know like saying oh well, i'm from rhodesia it's like well <laughs> yeah. but it, it was it was interesting because i mean that that was his home and it may not exist but that was his home yeah that would be weird to 
been born and raised and lived most of your life in a, a place that doesn't really exist anymore. Well, I think that would probably be the closest comparison you would could have to some of these um, Anglo um, people that were like, okay, maybe they were a little bit more sympathetic to India is you know, they weren't, yeah, like they were just raised so far away. But again, a lot of them went back to England to go to boarding schools. And so they spent like yeah. their early childhood in India or something, and they went to England and spent their formative years in England and then went joined the foreign service or went off somewhere. So there, it's, I think it's a form of third culture, which, you know, there's some research on that, you know, like they call them third culture kids, like um, John Huntsman's kids, you know, where they're just raised everywhere. Um, like our daughter would be considered a third um, culture child because, I mean, she's lived in four countries about equal time, about, you know, three or four years each. So where, where's her home? Um, right. She digs into the, I'm an American, you know, like waving an American flag around thing, you know, I'm American. <laughs> it's like, well, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. And I guess I could see, you know, uh, living and maybe growing up in a, a country that's not really your country may, could like sort of solidify your identity with your home country, even though you don't really spend much time there. Yeah. Um, read, um, uh, this, no, and I'm thinking of the Hemingway, but uh, Burma days, George Orwell's Burma days. And it's a pretty good, um, kind of, it was a novel about, you know, um, colonial, I think he was a timber agent living in Burma and, you know, he has his employees and such and just how the the British segregated themselves. Um, the funniest anecdote I got from it was um, there was a local fellow that was a book trader. So he had a big wagon full of books and he would come and someone would give a book and give him a book and he would let him pick a book and there was a small fee. But he would not accept the Bible, and he's like, the Bible, man, this thing is evil or something. It must have some very dark magic, because people always want to give one to me, but nobody ever wants to take it. <laughs> yeah, well, they're they're pretty abundant. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> they probably had a few copies laying around. Yep, yeah, I'm sure the Missionary Society brought. I wonder if, in that scenario, the Bible is sort of like, uh, you know, canned pumpkin filling for canned food drives right yeah <laughs> i'm sure pretty sure that was it it's like ah i want to get the newest thing oh what do i have oh yeah the missionaries gave me this let me go let me go trade that out <laughs> yeah i've got another copy it's fine <laughs> all right well that was uh kim philby like i said we'll be back soon with the first installment of frank wisner and uh we're going to go from there. So thanks for listening. Also, be sure to check out our socials. We're on Facebook at CIA Files, Twitter and Instagram, CIA Files Podcast, and the website, of course, CIAfiles.net. Um, like us, follow, rate and review on your favorite podcasting app. Thanks for listening, and uh, we'll be back soon. 